There are students from Stanford University. Our students speak Italian. Oh, uh, you, you, you will nail me like he is nailed. <laughs> Some of them over here, and uh, they would like to know about the place for me. Not for 
you. I'm ready. So questions. <laughs> many questions. First of all, there. You will definitely Yeah. Which way? Not that spicy. Um, you can get it along the. Chili here is not direct. It's not being chili, but it's not. Two hundred mil kilometers of it. I mean, you have the same type of organization. Or you are specializing in different pages of the university. It's quite the same 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 the same
which is why to come to Thailand is very cheap. <laughs> An increasing number of retired Europeans who, to live well, they go to Thailand or many to Central America or to come to because the Europe, let say, they are Okay. Um, communities that came together in the Southeast region of Asia. Do you think that it will benefit them? Because half of the countries in the Union are weak, economically speaking, and they've had a lot of conflict with China being one of the main leaders. Do you think that they can avert future problems by coming together, or should they just remain as people? Well, they're probably full of China, you know. And that, you know, in the middle of the tension, the Chinese uh, stopped to buy Japanese cars. But two months later, everything is wrong, you know. Investment is still going on, it is still going on. Uh, what? It is the learning of that. But the last thing, the truth should be somewhere. Does the youth benefit from this in the near future? This is thick, thick, this thing, in which nobody can, let's say,
close and will be continued in the years ahead in other ASEAN view. President Romano Prodi, who has been the Prime Minister of Italy twice and the President of the European Commission, and the time out of your very busy schedule to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to your keynote speech and to your important contribution. Thank you, Mr. Morowitz. Awards honorary doctorate's degrees to recognize the outstanding achievements of individuals professional stage to say a couple of words about President Prada. Good afternoon. Your Excellency President Romano Prati, Mrs. Prati. Your Excellency, it is a great honor to have a world-renowned leader and stamp a strategic measure to prepare our students mm -hmm. for the implementation of the ASEAN Economic QA. In the history of Stanford International University, as we also come for Professor Pauli acceptance of this honorary doctorate from Stanford International University, our Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe during World War II and the 34th. When I first came to know about Professor Prodi, I was struck by the breadth of his leadership abilities and he embodies Eisenhower's Good afternoon, Your Excellency, President Prodi, Ms. Flavia Prodi, Dr. Bunmak Sirina Bakun, Mr. Jill Mahe, the Honorable Michelangelo Pippin, Ambassador of Italy, the Honorable Mr. Anil Wadwa, Ambassador of India, faculty members, distinguished guests, and students of Stanford International University. It gives me great honor to welcome you to the fourth ASEAN series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. May I now please invite Mr. Uwe Morowitz, Chairman of the Board of Directors for the International Peace Foundation, to deliver his welcoming speech. And a warm welcome to the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political, non-religious foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's major universities, and I would like to thank Stanford International University for hosting our event today. Having started in November, Bridges has been continuously held in Thailand and Vietnam, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The fourth ASEAN series of Bridges follows the series of 450 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, and now Vietnam since November 2003 as an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue, where people from science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find new ways of cooperation and collaboration. After the success of its Bridges programs in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Cambodia, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international understanding by expanding its program in Southeast Asia to stimulate the intellectual and scientific exchange in the region. The fourth ASEAN Bridges series, therefore, continuously took place in Vietnam and Thailand from November to March, comprising ev events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates have visited the region not all at once, but separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of five months. 
The aim of bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with peoples in other parts of the world to understand, to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates and the world's brightest minds, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges has not been designed as a one-time event, but as a continuous process of synergies to make the series of events a sustainable success for Thailand, for Vietnam, and for Southeast Asia as a whole. I'm grateful to Stanford International University as well as to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make the idea of Bridges a reality. I would like to say thank you to everyone present today for taking part in this program. May it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue, transcending its definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. As the fifth ASEAN British series now comes to its close and will be continued in the years ahead in other ASEAN countries, such as Singapore, Indonesia, Laos, Brunei, and Myanmar, we look forward to the final highlight of the program. And I would now like to introduce to you President Romano Prodi, who has been the Prime Minister of Italy twice and the President of the European Commission, and who currently serves as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy to Mali and the Sahel. We thank you and your wife that you have taken the time out of your very busy schedule to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to your keynote speech and to your important contribution to build bridges. A warm welcome, President Prodi and Ms. Flavia Franzoni. During today's ceremony, we will confer an honorary doctorate of arts to President Prodi Stanford International University awards honorary doctorate's degrees to recognize the outstanding achievements of individuals professionally and personally, their contributions to the global community. Through this conferment of the honorary doctorate degree, President Prati will become a distinguished member of Stanford International University and represent the liberal arts program. Our liberal arts program is one of the leading programs in Thailand and it has provided educational services that will guide students to become strong global leaders with integrity like President Prati. May I now please invite the president of Stanford International University, Dr. Bunmak Siri Nawakun, to the stage to say a couple of words about President Prati. Good afternoon. Your Excellency President Romano Prati, Mrs. Prati, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, and faculty students of Stanford International University. It is a great honor to have a world-renowned leader and economist with us on this occasion. This is part of Stanford's strategic measure to prepare our students for the implementation of the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015. Today is a great day in the history of Stanford International University as we also confer an honorary doctorate of arts on Mr. Romano Prati. I want to express my deepest gratitude for Professor Prati's acceptance of this honorary doctorate from Stanford International University. I would like to start with a quote from Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe during World War II and the 34th 
President of the United States. The supreme quality of leadership is integrity. When I first came to know about Professor Prodi, I was struck by the breadth of his leadership abilities and his impact on society, as well as his integrity attributes that clearly defy global leader. He embodies Eisenhower's supreme quality of leadership, that is, integrity. Let me give you a very condensed review of his achievements. Professor Prodi studied industrial economics at the Catholic University of Milan. Earning a degree in laws with distinction, he held faculty appointment at the University of Bologna, Harvard University, London School of Economics, Stanford Research Institute, Brown University, and the China Europe International Business School. Professor Prodi has an extensive career in academia, international diplomacy, heading international organizations, and addressing international social, cultural, and political issues. He served as Italian Minister of Industry. He served twice as Prime Minister of Italy from 1996 to 1998, and again from 2006 to 2008. Under his leadership, Professor Prodi led Italy as one of the first countries to adopt Europe, Euro. Between his two terms as Italian Prime Minister, Professor Prodi was appointed President of the European Commission from 1999 to 2004. He was credited with preparing the way for the enlargement of the European Union. As you can clearly see, he has been actively engaged in the public service to the global community and for international cooperation. A significant thread run, running through these activities in his leadership, his integrity, and his adherence to the highest of ideals, this thread of integrity and leadership forms a strong connection between Professor Prodi and Stanford International University. Integrity, leadership, and passion for public service are characteristics that recur throughout Professor Prodi's distinguished career as a professor. <clears throat> as a publisher and a businessman, as an international diplomat and global statesman, these characteristics are intrinsic to a person of greatness. And Professor Prodi serves as a great role model for Stanford community, students, faculty, and staff alike. I hope this memorable confirmation will serve as a significant building block in the growth of Stanford International University and as a university of international stature, a university committed to integrity and global leadership. The legacy Professor Prodi leaves in the university's history will inspire generations of students to follow in his footsteps and aspire to become leaders that can make a difference in their community. As ASEAN community matures and the AEC launches in 2015, Stanford has the responsibility to prepare its graduates as knowledgeable leaders within and without ASEAN. Professors Prodi Global Stature and Lifetime Achievements served to inspire our graduates to set higher goals for themselves as they pursue their studies and prepare for careers. I now invite Professor Prodi to join me on the stage 
where I have the great honor to welcome him as a distinguished member of Stanford International University faculty. <clears throat> Dr. Bunmak will now present the academic regalia befitting for the new academic faculty of Stanford International University. And now, Dr. Bunmak will present Professor Prati with the official Honorary Doctorate of Arts Diploma. Thank you, Dr. Bunwak. Uh, uh, authorities, professors, and uh, students, I am very honored to be doctor of Stanford University, and uh, I understand how important it is for me to be linked to a community that is uh, spread uh, over all the world, that is uh, really shaping a new generation with a new, completely new mentality. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting to link it uh, to Bridge uh, that uh, has the same aim of putting people together. So from one side, a new generation that uh, will shape the future world. From the other side, an association of Nobel Prizes that they have already changed the shape of the world and they are sticking together in order to do it in an orderly way. And I am so honored to be in this uh, uh, top environment. And uh, my short speech of today, I say short because I know that uh, the most important part in the university's question and answer is uh, talking together, uh, will be how to work for peace in a, an environment that is changing so quickly that to be short in one sentence, going from monopolar to the multipolar world in which the problem is not anymore, let's say, how to handle a cold war, but how to meet, to make people and nations meeting together. And, you know, this is really a, a fantastic achievement uh, that we have to get, and this is a challenge that is uh, uh, the most important challenge that mankind uh, has in front of it. And I shall try to bring also one bit of uh, my European experience, in which uh, we tried really to forget centuries of uh, history of wars and tragedies and try with a uh, let's say, the humble job of uh, creating a new international environment in which peace could prevail. This is a very short, uh, uh, let's say, summary of my uh, short speech. Well, first of all, let us start from uh, the past. Uh, everybody must understand and know that uh, 18 and 19 centuries were the centuries of Europe. The 20th century has been the century of the United States. And everybody of us was ready to think 20 years ago that even the 21st century should have been the center of the United States. 
but in this period, uh, the world is changing much faster, much quicker than everybody of us have never imagined in the past. And even in the common language, the 21st century is called already the century of Asia, with the change that is uh, happening so quick in this in this moment. And the reason for that are political and economic. The economic reason is very simple. The change is uh, uh, beyond any forecast. Uh, few figures. Uh, in the 50s, in the 1950s, United States, they had uh, uh, from 45 to 50 percent of world GDP, and United States plus Canada and Europe, even if Europe came out of a terrible war, they had 68 percent of world GDP. Is 60 years ago, not not long time ago, from 55, 60 years ago, and uh, in the meantime, this will build, will link. Uh, our arguing to a second aspect, the political aspect. In the meantime, the uh, United States uh, was supporting the same shares of the military cost, of the military burden of the war, from 45 to 50 percent of uh, the military expenditure. And, uh, you know, this is why, even 20 years ago, uh, a famous historian was uh, talking about the end of history for because it was such a monopolar world in which uh, there was no, no room for change in history. And uh, now uh, the situation is uh, different. The uh, uh, United States are around, have around still uh, very prominent and strong and uh, uh, affluent country the world, but only 20, 21 percent of world GDP. Europe the same, a little more or a little less, depending upon the rate of exchange of the euro and the dollar. And, you know, so altogether uh, they are 40 percent of world GDP and the Asian share is increasing, increasing, and even more because of the rate of growth. It's, uh, uh, the balance will come much earlier than before. Probably in 10 years' time, the absolute GDP of China will be equal to the American one. This does not mean equal per capita, of course, you know, but uh, in terms of uh, of, of, of national income will be the same. And this is an incredible, fantastic change in, 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 world, in, in world history. Uh, this does not mean that uh, uh, even the military power changed with the same speed, because if you analyze uh, the military expenditure, you find that uh, today, United States, they spend a share that is not so different from the share they were affording in the 50s or the 60s. The military spending in the United States is around 40, 45 percent of world expenditure. And this is also the key of an unbalance. The United States, I buy by far, and we remain for a long time by far, the most powerful country in the world, but the burden of this role is becoming day by day stronger and difficult to get. Let's say United States, the most powerful country in the world, but cannot exercise this power alone because of the changing of the economic environment. So we are going, in this sense, we are going in the direction of a clearly multipolar, multipolar, multipolar world. And uh, clearly, uh, this uh, brings us to the fact that uh, it's uh, uh, all the burden that you have in the American budget, all the problems that you 
uh, read now on the future uh, austerity or necessity of changing the budget. They are in substantial part the consequence of an internal increase of expenditure, but also of this in strong intellectual burden that is still on the shoulders of the United States and the imbalance between the economic share and the military share of, of, of the world. And uh, this is the first uh, characteristic, you know. And uh, the Asian growth is uh, so important that you can sum up in very in one one picture, the picture of this year, not to be too academic, you know, but this year you will have a, a Asian growth starting from China that is the highest in the world. China is between 7.5, 8%. Uh, Asian can be a couple of points less as average, but all the country is growing. Uh, you have United States, 2%. And Europe zero, and uh, this gives you uh, how different is the movement in this in this period, you know. And uh, uh, look, uh, not only this, let's say, quantitative change, but a second phenomenon. It was very important in the uh, recent years: the financial crisis. The financial crisis in the United States has been at least partially over, uh, overpassed, you know, it's uh, uh, step by step uh, the country is getting out, but it's still hitting Europe and uh, is giving an additional contribution to the change, to the change in, in, in the relative power in, in the world. And this is even more important, even more important uh, that uh, this has given a question mark to the certainty of the market system. Market economy is still the foundation of our economy. Even uh, uh, the former communist countries, if uh, when they have uh, chosen the market economy, they have started to grow. This is the foundation of the modern society, but uh, uh, if not well run, if not well controlled, this can give imbalances to world economy that will heavily damage uh, the rate of growth of the most advanced economy. And this is, of course, now is given for granted. But if you read the, a lot of economic textbooks 20 years ago or 10 years ago, they were writing, the most part of them, they were writing that the big crises were over, that because of international monetary fund, because of Keynes theory, because of uh, cooperation. This was a problem of the past. Economic cycles were uh, thought to be a problem of the past. And this is another uh, uh, issue that have changed heavily the, heavily the reality. Uh, but uh, clearly there was also, as I told before, uh, some political mistake. Uh, in the, and I do think that uh, the beginning of, 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 the, uh, of the military, uh, of, the, of the political change is uh, the war in Iraq, the Iraqi war, in which the Iraqi war was supposed to be the seal of, of the American power and has been transformed in the beginning of the change because instead of being a few weeks war, it was long, long, long without substantial results, uh, uh, putting in an easy situation all the Middle East and so giving another, an additional contribution to the change of the political reality. Of course, linked to this, we have the Afghanistan war, and uh, it was not only a military problem, 
but it was a deep political change because the Iraqi war uh, was uh, for quite a few years the beginning of a split, of a division uh, between uh, European states, uh, between European nations, that has had a lot of influence in our history. Uh, you had from one side United Kingdom, Spain and Italy, from the other side France and Germany, one uh, uh, with a completely different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, foreign policy. And this has been a contribution to the division of the Western, of the Western world. Uh, and the, and, and the, another, the last, uh, the last uh, important change in the, uh, in the last generation, uh, it is a change that uh, is equally negative for the old countries and the new countries. And I put this in the end because it's not a contribution to the split, but is a question mark to the uh, peaceful development of the world. That is a general increase in inequality in the world. It's, uh, it's something that uh, has been underestimated uh, in the link with the financial crisis, but that we cannot underestimate. First of all, facts. Inequality has increased everywhere in the world. China, United States, uh, Europe, except very few cases, the Scandinavian countries, and the last 10 years, Brazil. But in all, uh, all other countries, we have an enormous increase in inequality. And this is bringing a problem to growth, because clearly uh, the distribution from the high consumption population to the low consumption high saving population of income, it, 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 is, it is a burden to the development. Uh, and it, it becomes difficult in the contemporary society. It is a contradiction to think, as many think that uh, uh, let's say, wage and salaries must decrease and have a cost competition, but uh, the uh, purchasing power of population must, and people must buy more, is a contradiction to think that uh, uh, the general population can buy more and give, and give push to the growth, and at the same time being paid less. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not sustainable. So, uh, I repeat, this is different from the, uh, the problem I mentioned before, because it's common to all the society, but is a clear, a clear uh, message of instability for the future world society. In this situation, clearly, uh, we, need, we need a new settlement, a new settlement of the world, we should need a strong cooperation, a stronger, stronger cooperation. We should need bridges. Uh, and in the, in, in the political problem of humanity, we should need a stronger, stronger United Nations International Association. And this is not the case. And I tell you frankly that in the moment of change, it's very difficult to agree on, 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 on common rules. Uh, not only in political problems, and then you have uh, the, the split on the Syrian case, on the Libyan case, not only on Iraq, you know, but you have still different interests. But even in, in, the, in, in the economic uh, reform that we need, take the example of the monetary system. We should need a complete reform of the monetary system that must adapt itself to the new economic reality that I described it before. And before any G8 in the past or any G20 meeting now, you read the papers and everybody will tell you this will be the moment of the big reform of the international system. It never happens. And in my opinion, it will not happen 
for a substantial period of time. Why? Because it's very simple. You know, United States has, has no interest to reform because now uh, the privilege of, of the dollar is strong uh, uh, in the world and China has no interest to reform because any reform that will be done later will be better for China. And so, uh, I repeat, the moment of change are not the moment for an agreement. And so, you will not be surprised. Uh, well, uh, in this, I have to tell a, a small uh, parenthesis. In this, I, I never mentioned Europe, you know, in this first part of the speech. And uh, it be, can be surprising for you for a former president of the European Commission, so passionate about Europe, but I want to introduce it now. In this situation, it's clear that you are not surprised that uh, even uh, Europe is in a difficult, in a very difficult moment, because even Europe is suffering uh, uh, the change of the political and economic situation I have described before. But, but clearly, I think that uh, the most important contribution to a world solidarity to prepare the idea of how the world must be in the future has been given by Europe. Uh, till 60 years ago, Europe has never, never seen one generation in peace. Since the Roman Empire, uh, I don't talk about the last years, you know, we always had wars. Uh, our young generation have, were always regularly dying in war, and already 60 years we are in peace. We are trying to build common institutions. We have problems at the euro now, but they are problems given by, as a consequence of a positive, clear idea of trying to build something together that will go beyond national states. You know, and we started with six countries. Now we are 27 countries in the Union, and 27 countries with uh, five, almost 500 million people. For the last census, it's 496 million Europeans together. And clearly, this, uh, this change cannot be done without uh, difficulties, without problems, without tension, without, uh, uh, let's say, the permanence of the old nationalistic ideas, you know, because it's, uh, <laughs> uh, we are changing the nature of, of the nations, you know, and this is, cannot be something that can be done in one day. And so uh, I think that uh, in this difficult change of history, the European teaching is, is, is so important. You know, uh, I, I'm always thinking uh, on the tension that you have in Asia. Uh, you know, if you think to Japan, China in this moment or other. But, but you know, do you really think that the relation between France and Germany were better? But there is a moment in history in which clearly you have, you have to tackle the problem, to, to, to try to, to, to understand, to change it. And in Asia, there is a great positive aspect in spite of all the tension that Asia has, the economic links are, are increasing. If you look at trade, uh, even trade among the countries that now have this dispute for islands, you know, blah, 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 trades, crossed investments, uh, cooperation, they're increasing day by day. And this is uh, the direction in which we have to exploit and to build our exploit uh, for the good, uh, the, 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 political, the political behavior and build a better future. We can do it. I think that, of course, you need imagination, you need uh, good faith, you need time, time, time and patience. But, but uh, the, uh, the 
today situation in Europe, and I am speaking of today, the worst year, worst year for European history in economic aspect of it, you know. Uh, but even taking account of that, I think that we are in a situation that has been uh, never achieved in the past. So I, I, I take this an example how to regulate uh, the passage from this monopolar to the multi, multi, multipolar, 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 multipolar world. And uh, we, have, we have the possibility to do, to do it. Uh, uh, and we have already, and I end with this, many, many uh, indispensable fields of, of cooperation. Let us take, well, because it's my experience now, let us take Africa. Uh, everybody now is interested to Africa, no? all the big powers for very understandable reasons, you know. Uh, the growth of mankind, the improving of diet, the improving of income, they have a consequence of uh, need, uh, new need for food, uh, raw materials, and energy. Where are they? Africa and Latin America, uh, the two continents in which you have more possibility of growth of that. And it is clear that if we use the old system of taking Africa as a battlefield, it will be a disaster for everybody. If we start, let's say, trying to have uh, Africa as a field of cooperation, we will be better off for Africa and will be better off for all of us. And remember that when I when I talked to you before on the different rate of growth in the world, I didn't mention Africa. But Africa is because of this international uh, uh, need of raw materials. And Africa is waking up. Well, uh, I cannot talk of an African spring because spring is a nice season, you know, and Africa is so poor. But this year, Africa has average in spite of Egypt, in spite of Libya, will grow between f 4 and 5 percent. So it's, and it's already six or seven years that Africa is, except Sahel, the area very poor where uh, growth is not uh, still going on, but Africa is moving, you know. And so this is the great occasion for, for mankind to try to exercise a positive change from monopolar to multipolar world, you know, a cooperation vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the new development that you have in Africa in this moment. This is clearly a very superficial picture of what is happening, you know, and uh, please don't, uh, uh, don't consider it as an academic perfect speech. It's not. It's just an introduction to the discussion that we have to do together to understand uh, which are the political changes that we need to, 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 to make in order to have a peaceful world that are possible, that are clearly possible. Difficult because, the, as I repeat, but this is, must be clear, the moment of change are difficult to tackle, but they are for all of us a great, great opportunity. Thank you. Very thought-provoking speech. I would like to now open up the floor for a Q&A session. May I now please ask the audience to ask questions for Professor Prati. Three questions and then answers. And three questions and then answers. Three questions. Let's go. There will be two mics going around. Um, for students, please identify your name before asking the question. Thank you. I only ask to speak slow, loud, and clear. Good afternoon, Mr. Prodi. Welcome you to in Thailand. I am Fernand from French Citizen. 
I will go straight forward to my question and to make it short. You have been in Bruxelles, been in charge of Italy. Every day when I open a newspaper, I heard the word market. Today, I heard in ships there is problem, market go up, go down, you go, you go up, go down. So I want to, I wonder who governs the world, politic or the finance? Because me, when I go out on the street, there's a red light, I stop, and when there's a green light, I go. That is one matter. The second matter, why politics don't take action to uh, inequality, to poverty, and uh, now we have a big discussion between all the presidents of Europe about should we do austerity or not austerity. At the end of the day, since, since 30 years, 40 years, I am very interested in politics. Now I tell you straightforward, I don't trust politic people anymore because nothing, nothing changed and we are going straight to the wall. I don't talk about Asia, I talk about Europe. So make, that makes me a bit disappointed about politics who are in charge of Europe actually. Sorry, my English is not so good, but I hope you catch my point. Okay. You want to answer now? Well, I answer uh, because you did three questions, so I can answer. <laughs> Look, uh, I start from the second one. Why inequality and what to do? This is, look, uh, this makes me thinking uh, as an economist, but even more as a politician, you know, because inequality is linked to your first question, international market, in which you have uh, the sovereignty is going out of the governments, you know, so uh, you are really right when you put a question mark on the real strength of, of politicians, of the political life, because uh, with the mobility of capital and the globalization, globalization without an authority, you know, now the sovereignty of, 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 of the different state is decreasing day by day. I used to provocate uh, my students or by telling them that now there are only two sovereign states in the world, United States and China. The other countries are not sovereign states for the reason that, you know, any time that they uh, take a decision, this is the consequence of uh, capital flowing uh, out or, uh, let's say, um, giving out of any possibility of control, you know. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, I, I cannot give you uh, an answer that will, say, will satisfy your, 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 your desire and your insatisfaction. For the reason that uh, if we have now, if we don't arrive to a moment in which we can handle a common system, we shall go on in this, uh, in this situation of uh, the markets prevailing on the, on the uh, national policy. And, you know, uh, part of this uh, uh, is the, uh, from that uh, we have an explanation uh, let's say, uh, well, the most important explanation of, of the inequality that you mentioned before. Uh, the, uh, the triumph of the financial aspect of the economy vis-a-vis -vis the manufacturing aspect of the real economy and the possibility of moving country by country has made, uh, uh, let's say, has moved the income to a different uh, uh, type of, uh, of people, uh, financial banking, uh, uh, and so moving from, from one class to another class. And 
increasing the division, you know. But uh, there is another reason, in my opinion, even stronger for inequality, and is how the democratic system is is based now, or uh, let's say, uh, in uh, in the last uh, uh, thirty years after the revolution, that from some point of view was indispensable and necessary in order to increase competition and increase uh, the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the productivity of the world. But after the revolution um, brought by Reagan and Thatcher, uh, you cannot anymore talk about, mention taxation. In any election, if you mention taxation, you lose the election. And we are, we, we, we were moving, and you know, like or you don't like or you like it, uh, taxation is the most important instrument for a redistribution of income. Of course, that nobody likes it, but this is this is the truth, you know. And if you decrease and you put flat taxation because of the financial uh, mobility that evades, you know, that flows away from taxation, clearly you have an increasing uh, difference between, between uh, wealthy and poor. Combine it with the globalization in which competition is in manufacturing, uh, but not in finance. And so you have these forces that will bring to inequality. And so you 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 would say I don't trust politics because they have not done anything on 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 against uh, inequality, but they are powerless in, in real terms vis-à-vis inequality. You know, and uh, uh, look, nobody wants to lose elections. You know, and this is the tragedy. And so nobody tells the truth to the electorate. The moment there are moments in which you have to say, look, there are moments in which you have to decrease taxation, but there are moments in which you have to increase taxation, and nobody dares to do that because, uh, and then we 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 don't tell the truth, and uh, another problem that I was discussing with the students uh, when we were when we were at lunch a few few moments ago, you know. Uh, if you want to improve equality, you have to work on main, one main instrument, that is education. You know, equality means a, a standard level of, of, of education for, for the entire people. And, you know, education is a long-term strategy. The results of education are after 10 years, 15 years, you know, long time. But, because of the modern and contemporary democratic system, uh, uh, you know, the uh, politicians, they are obliged to look only at the short term, to look only to the next elections. And so you have a terrible contradiction that when you are in politics, you understand that you must spend more on uh, primary school, nursery, university, education, but then you have election next month, you know, and then this is the terrible contradiction of, of, of our democracy, a contradiction that is the problem even in Europe, you know. We have, when the crisis, the, the Greek crisis started, the problem was very, 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 very small, manageable. It was, you could fix it with 30 billion euros, let's say 40 billion dollars for a count for a big entity like Europe is not is not such a big problem. But you had elections in the in some of the leading countries, namely local election in Germany. And so the decision was postponed, postponed and when the decision was taken, it was not thirty billion, but 300 billion, you know, in four months. And, uh, but this is how democracy works, you know, and this is a big challenge of our democratic system vis-a-vis 
uh, the, the, the authoritarian system. I, I had so many discussions uh, in China, for example, about that. You know, uh, I remember a Chinese authority telling me, "Look, uh, how can you handle uh, your long-term problems in a democracy in which you have local elections, regional elections, national elections, uh, European election? It was Europe, and that." You have election every three, four months, you know, and you think only to new election. And this is this is real a problem. Even more, and not only in European uh, in European uh, cases, but even in the United States. Not only you have interim election, but when you have let's say even local or partial election, uh, this because of the opinion polls, they have a, a, a terrible natural, uh, general consequence, you know. Uh, I always give the example uh, when Ted Kennedy, the Senator Kennedy, died. You know, he was a Democratic, you know, and uh, in that moment, uh, the Democratic members of the Senate, they were 60 and only 40, the Republicans. And so the Democratic lost election after the death of. And you know, in this case, what about is not important. But the opinion polls for the next election immediately change it. And all the decision making process were changing, you know, and politicians, even the Democrats, were not were not even uh, let's say uh, in the in the mood of uh, taking brave political decisions because of the fear of losing the elections. And these are the explanation of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the disparity uh, that we have in the world. And so the, because of that, look, it's not the moment to say, I don't trust politics, because we need politics. We have, we have to change it. We have to look clearly on the problem that we have in front of us and try to, and try to change them, because uh, uh, it's not uh, the over uh, the, 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 the exceeding power of politics, our first problem is that politics is powerless uh, for the real political problem that we have to solve, you know. And uh, we have to put politics in, in, in the right position in order to take decision, you know. Uh, this, is, this is our challenge, not only European, but uh, of all countries of the world, and the uh, United States included. Next question, please. A lady. There was a lady. No, 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 no. You are already started. No, 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 no. Um, I just want to say we are, I'm on the same side of the fence that you're on ideologically, but I would like to know what you think, uh, considering the greater good of the European community, the greater good of the European community, the euro, has it been an asset or a liability? Do you, <clears throat> Sorry? Yeah, considering the greater good of the entire European Union, um, would you say the euro has been an asset or a liability? I, I, look, uh, I am not the right person to answer because I was one of the greatest supporters of the euro and I am still a supporter of the euro. Uh, 
because uh, I think that uh, uh, because of the explanation, well, explanation of what I, uh, the thought I expressed before about globalization, I do think that uh, the single European nation, they will disappear being alone. And to transform uh, a nation, you need to work on the two pillars of, of the modern state, the army and the currency. And so uh, to put together the army, uh, uh, Europe tried in the 50, and uh, it was impossible, but you know, will be necessary in the future. But uh, for the currency, it was unavoidable to tackle the problem. And uh, uh, I do think that vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the future of Europe uh, to be without a common currency will be a persistent weakness, leaving the different state to make diverging policies. Of course, this is the general problem. Of course, we did mistakes. You know, uh, when you do something absolutely new in history, you do mistakes. And we knew, and I, I also wrote uh, in many interviews, uh, and I was also accused to be too tough on that, we knew that we needed uh, to accompany the common currency with common decision in in financial policy and uh, taxation policy. And when I raised this problem to my colleague or to my counterpart, I do remember the long conversation with the, let's say, the most prominent, prominent politician in that time, the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Uh, of course, I was naturally, as any economist, telling, look, but if the currency is not protected, by by common uh, uh, monetary by common uh, banking policy uh, fiscal policy there will be a crisis and i wrote uh, uh, the euro will be stronger only after a crisis because it was clear that you needed common institution the answer was a wise answer of a politician you know uh, but wise they say look it was so difficult to convince the Germans to abandon uh, the Deutsche Mark and to make this passage, or could be told the same for the French or for, 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 for the Dutch, that now we have done this and the consequent decision will follow. Uh, but what, ha what happened? The world changed because of immigration, because of globalization, because of uh, nationalistic revival. You know, uh, the solidarity that was in that moment ready to make the steps stop it, you know. And, 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 and then now we are in the difficult moment in which we have the crisis. But, but, let us be clear, after the decision taken, by the European Central Bank last summer, the euro will stay, will stay for the future, will not be, there will be not any collapse. Of course, the decision to be taken will be slow, uh, must be discussed uh, in many, in many, in many ways. They will bring another, another unforeseen, and I think, very worrying consequence that uh, Europe will be, we shall have two Europes in the sense, working together, being the same union, but one, one group of nations who will share the euro will, put, will, 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 will uh, work together much more than the euro group of nations that will not share the euro. So we shall have additional difficulties to manage this in the future, but there is no, no alternative. And uh, don't think that uh, even the Cyprus crisis or will dissolve the euro. 
uh, the euro is a reality and will be the instrument for Europe to be present in the world. Not, of course, will be the European Central again, but at least with Europe playing the role and giving, even to Asia, the example of cooperation that is necessary in the world of today. Hi, Professor Prodi. My name is Mei Li. Um, I know that you're involved in an organization that promote peace, global peace. What are some of the activities that are engaged in promoting peace? Thank you. Look, uh, well, I'm not engaged in global peace, but just in a small piece of global peace. Let's say the task that I temporarily have, you know, is uh, the Secretary General uh, uh, of the United Nations uh, asked me, look, the Sahel is the poorest area of the world. Sahel is a definition that is not even understood, understood by the experts. It's a strip of land going from Senegal, from the Atlantic Ocean to Eritrea. You could think uh, long 5,000, five, five, 6,000 kilometers and 1,000 large. That is the poorest area of the area and uh, in which you have not any common uh, project of development. Uh, small, poor states uh, with poor governance, no infrastructure, no economic links, and you cannot build a modern progress, a modern economy, if you don't have some sort of cooperation. And what, what uh, I've been asking is to start this process of, of inter-country cooperation of, of the Sahel. And what I'm doing, first of all, to try to connect the universities of the area in order that the development comes from, not from United Nations, New York, or Geneva, or uh, uh, World Bank, but with the contribution of the local universities. And, and then to try to link which are the priorities that are very simple, you know, because in this case our infrastructure, energy, decentralized energy, and the big revolution in this case to bring development must be the same type of revolution that Africa had with the portable telephones, you know, to have energy, solar or uh, decentralized, because without energy you can't do anything. Education and health is not, and then to try to, to, to but uh, uh, from the other side, and this is the most difficult aspect of it, uh, to try to, co let's say, to, 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 to connect the financial resources that are necessary to that, you know. Not easy because it's a moment of uh, a difficult crisis, but uh, trying to put together all the big players, in all the players in the world, not only the big, exploiting what? The common fear about terrorism. In, uh, I told you how divided was the Western world before, but in the case of Sahel, of the sub-African area, and Mali now, uh, the fear for the terrorism that is spreading in the area is common to Russia, to China, to United States, to United Kingdom, you know. And so my effort now is to try to Let's say to tell them, look, there is a common interest. First of all, to have cooperation in Africa. Second, that you know we have a common enemy. That uh, you know, if we don't, uh, if, if we are not linked together, uh, we prevail. And uh, this is not easy. Uh, why? Because uh, we never had this type of cooperation, of active cooperation. And uh, so I am trying to develop a new idea, you know, not to have a fund uh, that is managed by UN or, uh, you know, but 
the priorities I settled by international body, but uh, the responsibility of investing is uh, uh, on, on the donor, let's say, put it this way, if the German choose to build a hospital, they do it, Germany does it, and put the German flag. If China wants to build a, ra a railroad, well, it will not put the money in an in a undefined fund, but will build the railroad. And then they put his flag, you know, and to create some sort of virtuous competition in aid and trying to uh, put down bureaucracy that is not trusted, not by United States, not by China, not by anybody. You know. This is the effort that uh, I am trying to do. Uh, of course, I only start the job. Uh, this will go on for 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, well, you start the process and then who knows? Next question, please. Hello. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. What do you think about the conflict between South Korea and North Korea? And not only South Korea and North Korea, about no. China and uh, the, Philippines? The, the, the conflict. conflict. About China? No, no. About North Korea and South Korea. And all, because uh, there are so many conflicts in this area, in, in Asia, okay, like the conflict between South Korea and North Korea. And also the conflict between China and other countries like Vietnam, Japan, yeah, yeah. Philippines. No, no, I, 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 look, <laughs> of course, I, I don't want to be too naive on that. You know much more than I do. But uh, I only see that there is, is a strange uh, contradiction, you know, in Asia. Uh, for the island, you have increasing, increasing tensions, and you know about what? About what? Not certainly about islands, you know, but certainly is a general problem of power because the problem of islands can be solved in one in one second. You know, it's a, it's a simple, very simple problem, and uh, the island are not California or. Uh, let's say, but uh, the contradiction what is that in spite of that uh, the uh, Asian economic clusters is going on very well and trade uh, in cross investments are better and better every year and you know I uh, the example is of the interdependence is so simple. When you have an earthquake in Japan, uh, the Chinese factory stops. Or when you have a flood in, in Thailand, the same. You know, and when you look at statistics, I see that uh, uh, this is an increasing uh, uh, reality, you know, a fantastic new economic world of cooperation not planned, but real cooperation. And uh, as an economist, I, I, I mix it. And I, I, I think that this is able to balance the political tension, because we arrive to a moment in which, in which uh, it's clearly a common interest to have some sort of agreement. Of course, politics is also irrationality. You know, if you look at the first, uh, the first and the second world war, uh, it was the irrational side of it that prevailed, the pure power. But there are new strengths that will push for an agreement. And, you know, uh, I do think that because of the different characteristics of uh, uh, the country involved, you know, cost of labor, different skill in China, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, the role of the different role of the multinational companies uh, uh, of Korea and the Chinese company. I do think that uh, 
uh, the, uh, the feeling, the consciousness that uh, uh, there are strong common links uh, is becoming, in spite of the political tension, is, is becoming stronger and stronger every day. And I do hope that uh, uh, the wisdom not, let's say, at least to delay uh, the, the, the fight and the tension will bring, will bring, uh, will bring uh, to a really new, new reality of the world. As a European, clearly, I do understand that this will bring the center of the world far from Europe. I, I have the clear feeling in my mind, but I do think that uh, this is uh, a necessity for peace, and this is a necessity for Asia, and this is also uh, uh, possible because of the transformation of uh, and, and the new interdependence of Asian economy. When you understand how companies, uh, factories move from China to Vietnam, to here, to where, when you see, the, look, this is something that never happened in the world, you know. Let us hope that will help also peace. Good afternoon, Professor um, Prodi. My name's Arnie. Can you speak loud, please? I am very, 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 very old. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my name's Ar um, Ardi. I'm a student from Faculty of Liberal Arts. And here's my question. The present European financial crisis was apparently allowed to happen by politicians. So how can peace exist in a global consistency of concept of corrupt politicians and bankers, and is politics and peace an oxymoron? Thank you. Is the, last part? The, the last one? Is politics and peace an oxymoron? You, you mean, uh, the Europe, if I understood well, uh, your question is concerning uh, the interaction between politics and economics inside Europe and the tension and contradiction that are existing on that. Is it the question? Yeah. Well, let us pretend that this is the case. Uh, uh, now, look, uh, I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, we are, um, in a moment in which uh, uh, we are obliged to, 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 to write a new, a new picture of uh, uh, the intra-European relations. I hinted, and I told you before, what we were thinking when the Euro was done. Now we have the clear idea that uh, we have to harmonize the European policies. And uh, the effort uh, uh, must be in this direction. And will bring, uh, uh, I think, as I hinted before, positive results, even if will also bring probably to a two-speed Europe. Uh, this is, uh, the future will be how to run uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, contradiction. Because we uh, have arrived ma now and to a final point, you know. Or, uh, let's say, if you stay together, you must be deeply together. If you have a concept of European Union like a, more like a trade area, uh, you can, uh, you, you also uh, have the possibility of not sharing all the decision-making process. And this is reflected by, by the recent uh, internal political debate inside the United Kingdom. You know, uh, 
when the British Prime Minister, with a very intelligent speech, that was was very well balanced, because he didn't tell I want the referendum immediately, and he didn't tell I shall not want the referendum whether to be inside Europe or not. He simply told we shall have the referendum after the elections. You know, uh, in, in 2016, he told that uh, Britain will take time to, to, to have a decision. But also, uh, it was clear that they understood that Europe will go on and uh, will not, uh, will be impossible to, 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 to stop this process. So, uh, I am optimist that uh, Europe will, 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 will make the necessary steps. There are all the interests to, 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 to that, uh, even from Germany, because now, uh, look, uh, uh, from the political point of view, inside Germany, you have a debate uh, in which uh, uh, it seems to prevail the idea that Germany alone could be better off and so on and so on. But when you talk with the German business community, they understand very well that if, if there should be a split between uh, the German Euro and the non-German Euro, the rate of exchange of the two, of the two uh, Euro will be so damaging the German economy that Germany could not be, be the same. And so uh, it's not only interest of the South European countries to be closer and closer. The best interest is a German interest. So this is the reason why I think that uh, uh, the, common, the common glue the common glue will prevail, except uh, UK, that they have to decide politically what they want in their future, you know. My opinion is that in the end of the story, they will choose Europe, but uh, they have not yet uh, decided, you know. And in the meanwhile, Europe must go on because we cannot wait uh, you know, the decision of, uh, of, of any country, you know, is a necessity to overcome the crisis and we can do it only together. Next question, please. My name is Alice Mdoe. I'm from Stanford International University and my major is communication arts. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, what is Italy's stance in the Arab Spring, and how do you think it will affect Italians' relations with the Arab world? And during your speech, you said there are two sovereign states. So does it make globalization a friendlier term of neo-imperialism? Thank you. Uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, well, in terms of, of, of Italy, certainly the Arab Spring uh, has damaged a lot Italian economy. Italy is very active in the Mediterranean, and <laughs> from this point of view, uh, the, the, the problems of, of change and turmoil happen in the countries in which Italy is the first or the second trade and investment. First in Libya, second in Egypt, uh, uh, second in Tunisia, second in Syria. <laughs> so uh, clearly, uh, uh, by chance, not certainly because of uh, our responsibility, uh, because we are a Mediterranean country and we are very active in trade and investment in all, in all the area. But the problem is that nobody knows uh, which will be the end of this uh, process. It's still going on. And, uh, you know, I was very recently in Egypt. I followed deeply Libya. And uh, 
the game is not uh, is not over. You know, the situation is still full of tension. Is an ever never land, uh, ever uh, ending revolution. You know, it's uh, and this worries me a lot. This worries me a lot. You know, because in Egypt uh, that is the key of the area. Egypt is 80 million people, maybe 100 million people. You know. Uh, but not only the key in terms of population, but the place in which all the uh, Islamic thought is elaborated, uh, uh, teachers, uh, uh, doctor is uh, going from Egypt to the other nations, you know, and this situation of, uh, uh, I repeat, uh, not settled, uh, uh, Governance is is very 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 worrying. Uh, unemployment is growing. Uh, tourism. I went to Cairo, and to see Cairo without any tourist is something that is really it keeps your mind, you know. It, uh, and uh, so uh, I do hope that uh, the Arab Spring can be. Are really reinforced by 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 uh, a solution of of the existing political political problems, you know. Uh, but uh, I am not uh, optimist to see it uh, uh, to see the immediate uh, the immediate uh, solution. Uh, uh, the complexity of the social structures of this country. Uh, you know, makes the passage to democracy uh, much more difficult than anybody, me included, uh, thought and hoped. I, I was thinking of one year uh, of turmoil, of tension, and then, you know, the recovery, but uh, it's already two years, uh, and uh, I don't see any immediate recovery. Buongiorno, uh, I'm Alessandro Ursic, uh, Italian journalist. I have a follow-up question on the issue of Europe and the current crisis. You express the belief that faced to the current crisis, Europe in the end will choose more integration. But at the same time, at the electors level, in the last couple of years, there has been a growing wave of Euroscepticism, both in northern countries and in southern countries, which are heavily in debt. So how do you see this contradiction between the need for more integration and the popular will for actually less integration? How do you see this contradiction play out in the future? Good question, but uh, I do think that the contradiction is solved by the electorate, because you're right, there are many populism because of the crisis also there are a lot of uh, malaise, a lot of unrest, but, but, when you go to the point and you have to vote yes or no, as it, it happened in Holland or in Spain, you know, in Spain for Catalonia and the central government, but in Holland, uh, the anti-European parties were absolutely prevailing, but when you arrive to the real decision to say yes or no, we had a, a shift in the votes that nobody could have never imagined. And I am convinced, not because of uh, dream, but because of knowing people, that of course, when you are teasing, you are teasing. But when you go to the program, let us go back to the past, the European, they will vote for yes. And populistic party, uh, they have been in Europe for a long time. Haider in Austria, Le Pen in France, now you have even in Italy this change. But I repeat my experience that when you go to the point, people say, look, uh, our future is in Europe, not outside Europe. We will be taking one more question. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm a um, student of Faculty of Business, International Business, 
Uh, my question is, you mentioned that inequality deters growth. So I, I think we can define inequality, inequality in different contexts. In the context of um, Thailand, you can see, um, maybe you know already, you've noticed already in terms of um, job, the mar uh, job market, a lot of Thai people are very um, open to doing anything, laying and trying their hands on um, different stuff. Unlike um, developed country like in UK or in America, where there's very um, high unemployment rate, as a result of um, maybe not fully as a result of, but just because there's a social system there where people, when uh, when they are not employed, they have benefits to maybe grants from the government or um, social grants where it allows them to live on something while they are unemployed. And that system, it's not here in Thailand yet. People don't depend on government to give them anything. They have to set out to do stuff by themselves. So my question is, do you think there's a future for social system in a country like Thailand in the, in the com like I said, in the future? Um, is there a, a, a system for that? Will that work as the economy continues to grow to become um, a world economy or a major um, world economy? Is there a future for social system in Thailand or in other Asian countries as well? It's not easy to answer to your question because I don't know, I have to be honest, I don't know Thailand as deep as I should know in order to answer well to your question. But, you know, and my definition of inequality was very simple, a definition for an economist, the Gini coefficient, you know, let's say, the rate of injustice that you you can uh, score with uh, some mathematical formula. So each country has its own problems, you know. And so uh, I should be, you know, I don't want to behave like uh, somebody that thinks to uh, to be able to to, to answer to any question. But really, uh, there is some general aspect of inequality that worries me more. One, I have already told you, and is the, how you tackle with the government intervention and taxation and this problem. The other one that I think will be important for the future of Thailand, but I am prudent, you know, is the new technology. And because uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have listened many lies about uh, the information technology. Uh, is a revolution that is different from the others, at least in my personal opinion. I have not yet read uh, sufficient explanation, but uh, uh, this information revolution is a revolution that is hitting uh, the middle class more than others. It's not a revolution that, uh, you know, uh, in Europe, all the secretaries disappeared. You know, with the uh, computer and iPad, 90% uh, of the secretaries disappeared, you know. Millions of jobs disappeared. In factories, uh, they are not the lowest level workers who disappear, but the skilled, you know. And when in other revolutions, you had immediately after you know, the first technology, the, revol the technology, any technological revolution in the first stage makes jobs disappear. You know, you have, uh, let's say, uh, the, when the motor car went, uh, the, the builders of old, uh, uh, let's say, uh, horse uh, uh, cars, and then they, of course, disappear. But then. You know, you had not only car factories, but gas distributors, refineries, roads, and with the rate of electricity, it's been the same thing. In this, in this revolution, you have a destruction of the middle class, and uh, very few, in, 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 you know, not only secretary, but I asked to some of the biggest, European bankers, uh, how many will be the employees of the banks in the 2020? Half 
or more than half than now. Everybody answered me less than half. And then, let's say, tourism agencies, uh, uh, trade, you know, you have a revolution in which uh, the problem of manpower becomes uh, more and more serious. And this brings problem to any country that is not growing very, very, very fast. And uh, even Thailand, I think that uh, this problem of, of uh, uh, let's say, destroying in some way uh, a lot of jobs in the middle class will, will, be, will, be, uh, will be very, very important. In this case, mankind should need a new distribution of labor. We should need an authority telling, look, uh, uh, only 20 hours working per week in <laughs> everywhere in the world. But you know that this is completely impossible. And so we shall go, uh, um, the, the biggest problem, the biggest economic problem for the future is employment, is employment, you know. I end with, uh, uh, what I have been impressed in more in the, a small, uh, a very simple joke in, it was in New York Herald Tribune, you know, there was a, let's say, a small, a small cartoon uh, with a father and a son, and the uh, son asked to the father, Daddy, how many workers are needed in a modern textile factory like you have here in Thailand? And the further answer, in a modern te big textile factory, uh, the need is one worker and one dog. Say one worker and another? Yes. The workers that only looks that everything works well, and the dogs that is careful that the worker does not go too close to the machines. And look, I am really exaggerating this, but, but the new technology, the new information technology, the new technological change, they are uh, making the problem of employment the number one of the future problems of mankind. This is another reason why we should need uh, some sort of world authority, but clearly I am clearly dreaming now. I know that I am dreaming, but just to make us thinking uh, which will be the real problems of the future.